Hello and welcome to episode four of Inside the Stage Door. Today's guests, I've got two guests, I'm very fortunate. Um, I have uh, two podcasters, I've got a singer, a songwriter, uh, a cabaret performer, a fringe award winner, feminist of course, the amazing Mim Sa, and I've got writer, singer, actor, all round talented, great guy, very attractive person, Ellis Dolan. Welcome to Inside the Stage Door, guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Great to be here. Ellis, I'm glad you can be here. Um, Would you have otherwise been on tour at the moment with your pursuits? Uh, So School of Rock would have actually, uh, the Adelaide season would have finished. uh, We we would have finished end of April, I think, uh, is when we were scheduled. So so this, this would have been my time off. Uh, regardless, right. Um, but no, it's just it's just a, an extended time off. Excellent. Uh, for reasons outside of anyone's control. <laughs> and for the foreseeable future. Right. And 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 have they intimated when you would possibly be back on stage, or what's what's the story there? Uh, as far as I'm aware, there isn't there aren't any plans for School of Rock to continue, uh, or at least our iteration. Uh, there, there are no plans as of yet, and and just as a whole, I think the industry has kind of come to a standstill while we reevaluate how we do things, uh, because uh, you know getting a bunch of people in a crowded theatre sitting that close to each other is just a bit uh, unfeasible for the foreseeable future. So yeah, lots of lots of reimagining going on, uh, and and reevaluating how theatre gets made yeah right absolutely very interesting time for everyone um and for for those who don't know ellis you're from adelaide is that right originally from scotland but i grew up in adelaide right um pretty much mims here so uh so that's where home is i think oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> uh, speaking of mim uh you're from adelaide as well is that right i am yeah um how long have you been a performer for mim oh my my whole life my debut performance was at my mum's birthday party when I was four, and I sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Nice. And uh, started at Theatre Bugs when I was uh, five as a student um, with Joni Coombe in, uh, in 2000, I think. And yeah, continued there for uh, almost 10 years, and then uh, then went back as, a, as an adult to, to be a teacher there as well. So that was a nice full circle thing that happened. And Ellis, you're a teacher as well. There, is this right? Uh, I've I've dabbled in teaching a bit. I I taught at the Mighty Good Talent School, but I did I did have a good I did have a good time teaching the kids at, at Mighty Good. We had a lot of fun. Great, congratulations by the way on a thousand downloads for the podcast. Feminism ruins everything. No, we're we're really thrilled that um, that people have been listening. Like we um, <laughs> we we. It's been a running gag for the last three weeks where we've been like, it'll be like, we've hit a 500 uh, downloads. And then by the time we, we get around to making the post celebrating that, we've got to 750 or something. So, it's, you know, the, the pe- people have really been responding well to it and engaging with it, which has been wonderful. Yeah, we, I don't think we expected um, this many people to engage and tune in. So we've been really, really pleasantly surprised by, uh, by the response to it, which has been really cool. That's amazing. And are your listeners musical theatre people? Are they across the the, the community? Um, who are they? We we think that a lot of people who are engaging with it are are musical theatre related, whether they're performers or just fans. Um, I think I think because a lot of the topics that we've covered so far have been mm. quite musical theatre based. Um, that being yeah. said, we have, whether consciously or not, um, a lot of the topics that we covered in our first like five or so episodes many of the musicals we've talked about have been based on movies as well so um even if somebody isn't necessarily a fan of music theater there's normally a movie that um that ties into the discussion as well that they can um that they they are familiar with and uh, can engage with even if they're not as much of a music theater buff as um, as other listeners might be yeah right um, and can I ask, um, I'm, I'm going to direct this question to, to Ellis. Um, Ellis, can you explain, for those, for those who don't know, what is a feminist? Uh, 
Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, look, a feminist to me is somebody who has noticed the societal injustices that have been kind of ingrained into everything, every facet of our society that uh, imbalances things towards the benefit of men. And to me, a feminist is somebody who doesn't want that. <laughs> and and who, who kind of um, takes the time to educate themselves on how to better society for everyone involved. Because these societal structures don't just um, benefit men at the expense of women, it benefits um, men at the expense of a lot of other uh, minorities. Uh, intersectionality is a huge part of our, our podcast yeah. uh, ethos, yeah. for example. Um, but also recognizing that um, the, the patriarchal society that we have also negatively impacts men. It forces them to uh, emote uh, only through anger and that any other form of like compassion or, or or things that are strictly feminine are are bad and wrong and so I think a feminist is just somebody who, who looks at society and the way that society has been built and starts to question it for the betterment of everyone really right um, so you, you've always been a feminist Ellis in like in your heart in your persona I think so I think um, <laughs> I mean I, I I, I had a, I've had some really wonderful female role models all my life growing up. My mum, my, my gran, my granny, really, really wonderful, strong women all throughout. And I've, I've, uh, I remember in year eight writing an essay on The Lion King about how, um, how dumb it was that the, the, the female characters in that weren't getting enough respect. Yeah. Really, as part of our English degree. Um, but to me, uh, I, I I've always kind of had. I think I've always I've always like felt that way. But it, I I also recognize that my journey has been about learning, or unlearning, a lot of things that society has kind of ingrained into a lot of us. And like uh, looking looking back on on like my time in high school or something, I always kind of wish that I wish I was a bit more feminist then or outwardly feminist then. Um, but I suppose that just showcases that I've had growth over the years, which is which is a good thing. Yeah, great. Yeah. Now, Mim, you've also had some pretty pretty good success this year at the Adelaide Fringe. Um, you won the uh, Fringe Weekly Award, I believe, uh, for your 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 show um can you can you tell our our viewers what what the name of the show is and your experience with that yeah so my cabaret show is called friendly feminism for the mild mannered and it is a cabaret show exploring uh some of the key themes around modern feminism uh like i say in the show obviously it's such a widespread issue that we're not gonna get to everything so it mostly addresses toxic masculinity, which is kind of what Ellis was talking about, about um, uh, men being vulnerable, being quite discouraged. So it talks about toxic masculinity, um, rape culture being uh, the trend that we have these societal structures that protect perpetrators of, um, of rape and sexual assault and um, disadvantages victims. Um, and the show uh, delves into the Me Too movement as well. There's sort of a level of um, confessional cabaret in that where I um, talk about my own experience with that. And uh, it talks a lot, uh, we talk in the show a lot also about allyship. So if you recognize that um, these societal injustices, these um, gendered inequalities and um, these experiences of um, sexism and misogyny is something that you want to address and to work towards ending um how to be an ally and somebody who's going to help be a part of fixing that as well wow and and, and why why cabaret was did you find that was the best um the best genre to to um 
get your voice across, your music across, given the history of, of the genre of cabaret? Cabaret appealed to me for Friendly Feminism for quite a few reasons. Um, I really liked that I could incorporate my um, original songwriting into the show. Um, I liked that um, Cabaret kind of fosters um, a lot of dialogue with your audience. Like there's, um, there's a trend of it being a very vulnerable genre and there being a lot of intimacy with your audience. And I think that when you're tackling such a, a such a heavy issue, you kind of need to have that, that level of trust and openness with your audience. That yeah. I think uh, Cabaret really fosters. And um, I also liked the fact that I could be myself um, it's a trend that more often than not in, in cabaret, uh, there are definitely fantastic cabaret performers who kind of put on a persona when they're performing, but it's, I think, one of the only genres where you can also just just play yourself and present yourself authentically. And um, I think that a big part of feminism is, is was something that has been really effective in um, feminist discourse and in advancing the ideals of feminism. And something we saw a lot of in the Me Too movement is sharing your own story and making um, making a statement with with your truth and what has happened as your experience as um, as a woman in the world. And I think that it's much easier to to um, foster storytelling when you are just playing yourself and telling your own truth. Yeah. Right. Um... And did, did you um, did you approach Gluttony or did they approach you? How did how did that come to be? How do you how did you end up on that stage? Um, I I still feel really lucky that that happened. <laughs> um, basically, I I was a little bit lucky in that um, my friend, my dear friend Maddie Blankensop, who I love dearly, was the um, the sound and lighting tech for the first season of Friendly Feminism, which happened in the Cabaret Fringe last year. And she is also a Gluttony staff member. So she, bless her, was sort of like talking me up to her Gluttony pals, being like, there's this cool show that you should check out. <laughs> so I, I credit her a fair bit for this happening. Um, but essentially, yeah, there's a, there's a process that artists can go through to um, to submit their work to Gluttony, and um, it is a—it's uh, quite competitive and quite heavily curated. So I—I um, I felt very, very lucky to to be in their lineup, and um, yeah, I can't speak more highly of the team that put Gluttony together. Like, they're, right, they're really, really awesome. Amazing, and um, and for those who who didn't see your show, is it available to watch in this interesting, strange new world that we have? James, thank you for that segue. Um, so it's currently on Fringe View. So uh, Fringe View is this platform that the Adelaide Fringe have set up to support artists during COVID, where you can upload footage of your work and people can um, pay like a small ticket fee to be able to have access to um, to see the performance. So Friendly Feminism, um, the the filmed version of our Fringe season is currently uploaded on Fringe View. So, if you um, go to Adelaide Fringe's website and you search for "Friendly Feminism for the Mild Mannered," you should be able to um, to buy a ticket. It's twelve dollars, and you get to um, get to watch the show. Twelve dollars—that's so cheap. That's amazing. It's well worth it. I've seen the show I think four times in four different kind of iterations, and it's just—it's wonderful. It's such a wonderful piece of cabaret. I can't recommend it highly enough. And I'm not just saying that because Mim's literally right there. <laughs> While we've got you, Ellis, can I ask, um, you, um, I believe, spent uh, a bit of time uh, studying at NIDA, the National Institute of Dramatic Art. Um, what did you What did you study there? And how was the experience for you? I studied a diploma of musical theatre. I spent, uh, 2017, I spent uh, studying there. And it was one of the best years of my life, to be honest. Um, We were really fortunate enough that our first term, uh, we partnered up with the Sydney Theatre Company, and we were actually a part of their production, uh, Chimerica, directed by Kip Williams. Ah, with the amazing Anthony Wong. Yes, Anthony Brandon Wong was in it. Uh, So we spent two days at NIDA uh, when we first started. um, Inductions, 
learning, you know, here's the building, here's the library. Day three, we got sent to Sydney Theatre Company. Day three? Day three. Wow. Uh, they threw us in the deep end. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to learn how to swim swim quickly. So not only are we trying to, you know, get to know our each other as a, as a class uh, and, you know, come to grips with the facts like we were at NIDA, uh, we then are just thrust into a, a, a literal professional rehearsal space and um, just kind of expected to to become very professional very quickly and that taught us so much uh, in that we, 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 were at, we were the acting ensemble for this uh, production we, we learned so much from Kip and from all the other performers uh, all the while having um, regular classes like dance classes and uh, master classes with Philip Quast what? He surprised us one day. Yeah, he, he just came into the room and was like, okay, we're doing a master class. Amazing. It was it was incredible. And then, um, so that was term one, and then terms two and three were a bit more structured, were cl- regular classes, acting, singing, dancing, uh, with a, a whole host of wonderful teachers sharing their experiences. We had some directors, um, Mitchell Butel, Jason Langley, they would come in and do workshops with us. And we uh, and we had uh, people like Anne Marie McDonald and uh, Luke Byrne were our constant kind of singing teachers, and we just learned so much from all these professionals who were were actively working and participating in the industry and taking the time to come and teach us our craft and and uh, and and then and then yeah, we all kind of just went into the world after that. Yeah, right. Some of the class uh, continued on studying. Um, we've got people in I think four different institutions around Australia WAPA, VCA, NIDA and Griffith Conservatorium from our classroom uh, Some uh, one of our classmates walked pretty much straight onto a cruise ship and she performed there in multiple shows over a couple of years and I was very fortunate enough to uh, uh, to in the following year uh, get School of Rock and I've been I was on tour with School of Rock for, uh, since 2018 that's amazing. Did you get to um, did you get to perform Dewey during that time? I did. Uh, so I, I understudied the role of Dewey and also the uh, the ensemble. And I think by the end of our run in Sydney, I performed Dewey thirty five times. Wow! I kept count. <laughs> wow! Um, amazing. And, and it yeah, it, it was it was a phenomenal, unforgettable experience getting to play such a phenomenal role that is just huge like Dewey does not leave the stage much at all in the in the two and a half hours that that you're you're on stage and what you are on stage you are running around and hitting top G's um and and just being the biggest kid in, in the room yeah how do you um sustain um that vocal presence like five nights a week what's your do you have a warm-up technique what what's a sp- What's a special secret you can impart to our viewers? It's it's mainly an endurance thing. For for me, my role was really interesting because I didn't get to play the role uh, every night, um, nor did I guarantee that I would be on stage every night. There would be weeks where I would just be um, in the dressing room, essentially just kind of waiting for something to happen. And then some weeks where it's like, right, you're, you're playing this role in the first show, and then in the evening show, you're swapping to this show, and then halfway through that show, we're going to swap you again, and it gets really hectic. Yeah. So finding uh, finding ways to maintain endurance was really challenging. Um, but we we figured it out. We, we would kind of spend a lot of time in the rehearsal room uh, while we weren't performing, just kind of going through things, uh, particularly going through things with with the children who were on standby, we were always kind of giving them notes and, and and tweaking their performances. So that gave us swings an opportunity to to go over our things again. And we'd have rehearsals every week. Excuse me. Um, and so yeah, it's just kind of endurance and and consistency and just um, knowing when you're pushing yourself too much and recognizing when you're doing too much and and also recognizing when you're not doing enough enough to kind of keep it going. I know like we we had a couple of weeks between seasons um, 
like I think that our biggest gap was about a month. We we finished the China season and, and we had a month before we started the Brisbane season. And everybody coming back into Brisbane was like, wow, didn't realize how quickly you lose that endurance over that t- period of time. Yeah. And how quickly we had to pull it back up again to, to, right. to deliver the best show that we could. Amazing. Um, and Mim, what's your, what's your technique? Do you have a, a warm up technique or is it like Ellis? Is it endurance? Um, yeah, I, I would echo those same sentiments that a lot of it is vocal endurance. Um, I was especially found during isolation that I um, I feel like I'm very vocally unfit at the moment because I'm not, you know, performing every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think that after a certain period, um, the amount of warming up that you have to do definitely becomes less and less just because your voice is so used to going through the motions that right. you have to do. Um, I'm a, I was especially lucky. Well, a lot of the time when I perform, I'm writing, I'm singing material that I've written for myself. So I think I am extra advantage in that regard that I don't think I'd write something. Like, Friendly Feminism was still a really big sing for me, but it was a big sing within stuff that I felt that I could comfortably, consistently do. Right. Um, but also, I think um, hydration is my best friend. Hydration, um, yep. Yeah, like all throughout Fringe... I was the loser in the corner at Fringe Club next to the water fountain <laughs> while everyone else was like out getting drunk. I was just there like constantly sipping my water. Um, and yeah, I don't think you would have seen me on any occasion during Fringe when I wasn't performing where I didn't have a water bottle in my hand. Like, right. Just, just constantly staying hydrated was um, is, is my biggest thing right. when I'm performing, yeah. Uh, and Mim, can I ask, who are your... Um, who are your... I'm going to say, who are your cabaret influences? Um, there are a lot of people who I draw inspiration from. I definitely, there's no one person that I'm trying to emulate. Like I, um, I want to bring a lot of authenticity to my cabaret. So I don't want to just try and mimic someone else. I want to kind of bring my own brand to it, but there are a number of cabaret artists, um, especially female cabaret artists whom I really admire. Um, Michaela Berger is one of those people. I think that she is a phenomenal artist. Um, everything I've ever seen her do, I've been blown away by her her storytelling, by her like the cleanest vocals that you would ever hear. Um, and she's an amazing writer as well, and somebody that, um, like me, writes original music for her cabaret um, occasionally. So I, I really look up to her. Um, I love Tash York as a uh, a comedy cabaret queen um everything that she does i think is hilarious um and um i really admire amelia ryan as well and have been really lucky to uh, um work quite closely with her um she mentored me um in addition to um the, in collaboration with michael griffiths as well um they mentored me uh through some of the writing of friendly feminism so um yes yeah, she's an artist that i also really look up to and admire as well Wow, there's some great names there. That's that's fantastic. Now you're both you're both very talented. Clearly, you're both writers. Um, do you have anything that we can hear this evening? I'm sure we can whip something up. Yeah, we can put something together for you. That'd be amazing. Positions of authority, kissing your male friends on the cheek, using pink shampoo. A five year old boy who's rocking a tutu, a woman who earns more than you do. These things shouldn't bother you. Should consider growing a pair of Good evening everybody and welcome to My list of things that grown men shouldn't be scared of Wanting to experiment with drag Choosing to be a stay at home dad These things are up to 
What we can't do and what we can We all suffer for it So I'm calling bullshit Here is my list of things that won't make you Any less of a man And if a taller woman Wants to date you I promise that it won't Imagine Titanic isn't any cause for panic. You really gotta believe me, man. This is my list of things that won't make you any less of a man. So paint your nails a deep shade of mauve. Belt out the chorus to let it go. Get the drink with the swirly straw. Contour your cheeks, get that highlight popping Wear a fucking ball gown if that's your thing No one can judge you for it And if they do, then there's something you need to tell them To grow a pair of... Even though growing a pair is a problematic way to tell someone to toughen up because it equates typically male anatomy and therefore masculinity with toughness and that's sort of exactly what this song is critiquing <laughs> thank you everybody this has been my list of things that grown men shouldn't be said Mim, you, you sing with your own voice, a uniquely Australian voice, Australian accent, Australian content. Was that a, a conscious choice um, as opposed to an American sounding uh, singing voice? Yeah, it is important to me that when I write my own music and also when I'm writing in more of a music theatre genre in addition to writing cabaret, that there is a really strong um, Australian voice coming through there because you know it is my own natural accent and I and I want my um, my sensibilities to um, to be reflected especially in stuff that where I'm writing about my own experience um, like I'd like my voice um, and my natural voice to be really strongly portrayed through that yeah um, new Australian musicals that are being produced are so few and far between and so hearing an Australian accent singing music theater kind of catches you off guard and seems a bit surprising but it's the sort of thing that I want to be normalised because I would like to see in a broader sense um, Australian original music theatre um, being produced more and, and becoming more the norm. Are you working on anything in that genre at the moment? Can we expect to see something from Mim Sa? Yes, I'm currently writing a song cycle that is um, essentially about being a young person in uh, the 2010s and the 2020s. I was aiming to get this song cycle up and running um, for the Adelaide Cabaret Fringe this year, which would have happened in June in a parallel universe, uh, but now I'm looking to the future to, to try and find another time that we can lock down some dates so that um, A, this work can be put on stage, and B, I have a deadline to work to, so I actually finish it. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, we look we look forward to uh, seeing that when um, when it does it does come around. Um, what would you say were some of the the challenges as a producer producing your own show in Gluttony when it was a very competitive uh, environment to work in? This fringe season was odd for me because I was it felt like I was first and foremost the producer and then the performer aspect was kind of secondary to that as was the, the writing aspect 
mostly because I had already written the show and produced an earlier season of it, um, and the actual performances of Friendly Feminism were only sort of mid-February to mid-March, but the work that went into bringing it to stage started in, like, August, September 2019, so it was sort of like a six-month lead-up where everything that I was doing was producing and then the, the performing was really the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. I think a lot of producers found this most recent Adelaide Fringe like a bit of a slog and I I think that um, there were a lot of artists that were kind of struggling to, to fill seats and right. um, I think that maybe the start of COVID kind of contributed to that. Yeah. Um, but as for producing overall, I I never thought that that's what I would be doing, but it kind of happened out of necessity that because I had this show that I wanted to put on that I'd written, I just kind of had to be the driving force to make it happen. And then as it turned out, I, I really liked doing it and I um, kind of had good instincts about how to do it well to some degree and it's uh, something that I'd like to continue to do in the future because um, it's a nice when, when you're not feeling like your creative juices are flowing very much it's sort of easy to just like flip over to do some admin and then when admin gets boring and your brain starts <coughs> ticking into some more creative places you can kind of switch between the two I like that absolutely yeah it's a strange new world it's a, it's a scary time for a lot of people who have lost work who are on job keeper job seeker and they'll be really wondering, why should I go to the theatre? Why are the arts important to me? Ellis, could I ask you, um, why why are the arts important to society right now? And are they important? Uh, yes. <laughs> in short? Uh, in, in short, uh, yes, the arts are, are incredibly important. I think this time especially is showcasing how important the arts are because people are trapped in their houses kind of um yeah they're not essential workers a lot of people are just spending their time at home it's so important for for people to have access to a lot of this art and and, and a lot of people have been providing access like you, you look at i think andrew lloyd weber's youtube are putting up a different show every week yeah uh, that isn't usually accessible uh in any other fashion but they right. they they recognize the importance of giving people uh, an escape. This morning I watched uh, the cast of Community did a Zoom episode script reading um, for, for charity and so a lot of creatives are coming together to do things like that uh, to make the best of the situation to try and utilize their art to, to generate more good and to generate help for those who, who need it. I think all the donations were going towards providing food for essential workers and people who are on the front lines of, of, of fighting COVID. Yeah, right. So I, I think, if anything, um, COVID has kind of emphasized the importance of the arts to everybody, to, to our society, and, and the fact that um, there isn't as much help for the artists who are currently going with without work like you can't film tv you can't go to the theater you can't create in the way that we are used to creating and a lot of our artists are are struggling yeah. as well and the fact that there's such a reliance on art to kind of get us through get our, our more like get our morale boosted when we're struggling and yet there is an assistance being given to to the artists who are also struggling right is really quite sad to see yeah right thank you um mim if i could ask you um should theater be a safe space for people to explore art or should we be challenged intellectually emotionally and spiritually all the time i think that people go to the theater for different reasons and some people go to the theater safe and happy place for them um, where there is that element of escapism and some people go to the theatre to be challenged and some people want to do a bit of both depending on what day it is I, I very much fall into that category like sometimes I just want to go see something because it's fun and sometimes I want to like engage with um, some really you know serious and thought provoking 
content and I think that the theatre serves both purposes and I also think that it can do both at the same time. I'm very, very passionate about making work that has a strong social justice and political message and I know that there are some people who are really receptive to that and who really want to see work like that and there are some people who, um, for whom that type of theatre isn't their cup of tea and that's cool too. So I, I definitely think it's um, you know, just up to the taste of the audience member and I think both types of theatre are really important. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Um, Mimsa, thank you so much. Um, you've been amazing. Ellis, thank you for joining us as well. I'd like to thank you both for joining me on Inside the Stage Door, and I'd like to thank our regular contributors to this episode, Ipskit Productions, Tempo for Two, Tepo Films. Uh, I've been James McCluskey-Garcia from Reading Companions Australia, and don't forget to like and share our page for exciting future guests. Thank you for watching. <laughs>